Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, second episode of our podcast around uh, strategic partnerships, innovation, research at universities. My name is Kari Poutonen, and I'm the head of uh, the education practice at Fluido. And with me today is Alan. Hi, I'm Alan Hughes, and I head up education in the UK and Ireland. And today I've got the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dave Fitch, a seasoned professional with a track record in driving impactful projects and program developments in both the public and private sector. He's over 15 years experience uh, and a portfolio exceeding 50 million in high impact innovation and collaborative programs. Dr. Fitch has cemented his reputation as a catalyst for organizational success. As a former data lab chief operating officer, Dr. Fitch expertise lies in his ability to design and construct projects that not only meet objectives, but leave a tangible mark in the real world. His, his role as a critical friend to organisations speaks volumes about his commitment to not only guide, but to challenge and elevate projects and programmes he facilitates. Dr Fitch is deeply rooted in developing coherent approaches and establishing practical, operational and strategic foundations necessary for programmes and organisations to thrive. His work around a, a, revolves around enabling entities to not only succeed, but to do so with impact and innovation at scale. And in a world where the demand for impactful projects and programmes is ever increasing, Dr Fish stands out as a pivotal figure, offering a wealth of experience and a unique approach as a driving force behind transformation initiatives. Dave, talk to us about people, process and technology. How did they come together for you? I think this is kind of one of the key things if you actually want to get people to work together, to have impact and to deliver the impact at scale. These are, I think these are the really critical things. I think many organizations, they focus on people. You know, I need bodies. I need bodies in these roles to do these things. The process sometimes comes after that. And technology, to be frank, quite often is whatever happens to be lying around. Um, and you kind of see that in how lots of organizations work. You know, they, they, quite, they have the right people. That They may have some processes. They may not have any processes. And then they struggle, and then they kind of use whatever bits are around to try and work. And you find, actually, you could be far more effective and far more impactful, and life could be far less stressful if you actually try to bring these things together. Um, but I think the key thing for me is understanding the thing that underlines people, process, and technology is actually culture. It's how can you build the culture that actually links all of these th things together? Because it's easy to build technology that goes, oh, here's this platform, it's wonderful. You know, and you might think it may be great for managers and the people on the front line may go, eh, don't get it, doesn't work for me, I don't care about any things, it doesn't make my life any better. Um, and that's why culture is important, is to be able to go, this is our shared objectives, how do we actually enable everybody to get to where we want to go in ways that are as seamless as possible and as less frustrating as possible, because obviously life is always frustrating. Um, but how can you actually try and build systems to enable people to do their best? Um, and the reality is most people's best lives aren't about reporting. They're about doing things to, to generate impact. So how do you build the underpinning things that actually allow people to do their jobs? Uh, and I think that's the key role process and technology have. It's in enabling people. But this doesn't happen by accident. It has to happen by design. And that's the key challenge for organizations is how do you actually enable processes and technology and build a culture around that? Mm. Well, that's very fascinating, Dave. And um, one of the things that I'm curious about is that um, I mean, you've been at, at that role that you've uh, selected or been part of selecting a, a CRM system for implementation. And always one of the things that, that is curious for me is um, what were the primary reasons or, or business drivers then behind choosing uh, the CRM system? Well, I think if we're honest, when we talk about the data lab, it was very much, it was there. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody had gone, we need a CRM system. Uh, we could get uh, an educational license for Salesforce. And so they got an educational license for Salesforce. Um, so you had, you know, as I said, you had a piece of technology lying around, as I said. Um, what I realized once we started thinking about what is this thing and what does it do is actually you can make this thing do all sorts of interesting things. 
And you can actually go from having a CRM, which the business team used, to something that would support the business team, the HR team, the contracts team, the project managers, and they would support everybody across the organization to deliver a set of shared goals. And you could actually take, you know, Salesforce and you could massage it, tweak it, modify it, build processes in it that would actually allow us to do things at scale. Because the key thing they had with the data lab is most people don't realize actually for most of the first five years, it was a small team of about 20 people. And people would go, how do you manage to do all this stuff with such a small team? And it's like, well, it's because a lot of it was because you use Salesforce. You know, that was the underlying platform that tied everything together. This was the thing that enabled teams to work together. This was the bit where you, everyone knew where we were because you could just look at Salesforce and that will tell you, you know, this is the stuff that's been approved. These are the opportunities that are in the pipeline. These are the things the project managers are working on. This is the thing the contract manager is pulling a hair out over. You know, it's all in Salesforce and it's all open and people can look at it. Everyone can understand what's going on and everyone can collaborate. And so it was the ability to take this, this, this tool and then develop it, you know, embed our processes in it and then use it to deliver impact at scale. Um, and I think if we weren't able to do that with Salesforce, we would have had to have a real think about how we were going to work. But with Salesforce, we were able to iterate really quickly and we were able to solve problems. And, and that, for many people, that was the thing that actually showed the value. Um, it was one of, the, one of the first challenges we had uh, at the Data Lab was we funded innovation projects between you know, the private sector and academia. Uh, we've been doing that for about six months and then someone from the Scottish government said, oh, by the way, the money you're handing out is state aid. And you now have a whole set of other things you need to do to make sure everything you do is compliant. Uh, and I remember looking at that and thinking, actually, that's easy. Because I can just go into Salesforce, I can add a couple of different options for the opportunities saying, you know, what type of thing were they trying to do? Uh, how much funding do we get from the private sector, from the government, from the university? Roll all these things together. Salesforce does the math and says, yeah, that's compliant. No, that's not compliant. Job done. You no, know, so for us, it was one of those things you, you could take this quite fundamental change and you could actually roll out something within a couple of days that allowed us to just continue because we could do what we had to do and we could keep working. And all the other innovation centers were just like, you did what? And it was like, oh, this is all we had to do, you know, because we had the tools. It's a flexible tool. We can, we can iterate and we can update it to do different things as our needs and changes require. And, you know, people kind of went, okay, I'll buy into this. Because rather than just being this platform that Dave says we have to use, I now see how this solves problems. Mm. And the reality is if you're in a small team with lots of work to do, anything that solves problems is good. And then you can, you know, you can iterate through Salesforce in many different ways to solve many different problems. <laughs> and that's kind of what we spent the next four years doing as we started doing different things and as we started to scale and so on and so on. And, you know, and it was, cru it was the really crucial thing was having a platform that could grow with us was was kind of really really key so so, well, so how did how did the implementation of uh, the implementation of such a flexible a uh, product of salesforce align with your overall it strategy and business <laughs> objectives i think if we're going to be honest we didn't have an it strategy you know it was very much you've got work to do get it done and thinking about it really wasn't kind of on the horizon but the reality is, is I've seen lots of organizations where you, you expect to do lots of work and then you spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what did you do and then reporting on this. Um, I used to work for the UK Carbon Capture and Storage Research Center. And every quarter we spent three weeks working out what's everyone done? Because it was a collaborative project that was based you know, seven sites across the UK. And it was just like, what has everybody done? How do we pull the story together? And I was very much, when I went to the data lab, we're not going to spend three weeks every quarter trying to pull together this story. You know, as, as, you know, as, as a business, we don't have time to just stop for three weeks and try to try and work out the story. 
So it was very clear that we needed a platform that would allow us to understand everything that we were doing, everything that had done, and that was able to put everything together to help us tell our story. And that was a really key for us. Um, at the UK CSSRC, you know, we relied super heavily on Basecamp. You know, as a project management tool, you know, you can do lots of interesting things with it, but you can't get any numbers out of it. You can't talk about the number of students you've funded, you know, the number of things that you've enabled, because it's just not there. Whereas with Salesforce, we could build dashboards that would go, here's everything you need to know about the education program. These are the number of universities we've funded, these are the number of courses we've funded, the number of students we've funded, so on and so on and so on and so on. It's all there. And you just, it's all there to hand and you don't have to go around chasing staff going, what have you done? Because it's all there. And by having one single platform, <laughs> you know, it was all in one place and you were never in a position where if somebody went on holiday, somebody went on sabbatical, you just didn't have any answers for six months. You know, you weren't in that position because it was always there, you know, and it was very robust. It was very future proof. Um, and we started moving to, rolling out Salesforce, you know, across the team. This was when GDPR was coming out. We're like, well, this solves all those problems because you're not going to have Excel files full of people's personal details because it's all in Salesforce. And you, know, you can build all these really robust ways of working that solve all sorts of organizational and operational challenges. And, you know, Salesforce just solved so many problems it was really surprising you know it's kind of one of the things you just think i'll move to this platform it'll allow me to do things and then eventually you realize actually it allows me to do things it also stops people from doing other things which in many cases is really what you want because you know you don't have people having their own processes to do stuff you know if you want a contract issued it has to be on salesforce you know the contract manager has a list of stuff on salesforce and that's what they work through and it, it provides you know a robust framework for everyone to work together. And like I said, with a small team, that's really important. It is just going to enable people. Yeah. Can we actually dig a bit deeper into that? Because that, that's really interesting. You you've mentioned a lot of these, like it's you said you, it solves a lot of problems, right? There's always like typically some pain points that you're trying to address when you're 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 looking for some sort of solution. You you've mentioned there that it gives you know data. Um, visibility, kind of sharing of information, having mm. the kind of everyone working on the same information mm. was easier, reporting was easier, etc. Were there other things kind of that it, it really solved for you? Well, it allowed us to do things that we never thought we'd ever do. Mm. Um, so, for example, one of the things um, after about two years at the Data Lab, we decided to start running Data Fest, which is Scotland's you know, celebration of data and AI. Uh, and it turned into from just two events in Edinburgh to 60 odd events across Scotland, you know, where, you know, over 5,000 people attended some, some events somewhere. And you're in this position where you're organizing venues, you're organizing sponsorship, you're contracting the sponsors, you're doing all this additional work you never thought you were going to have to do. But, based on six hours of sitting there and working out some process maps and then six hours customizing Salesforce, you were able to go, okay, here's where we are. You know, the BD team had sponsorship targets and you could tell who'd done what because you could build the dashboard and this would show, this is what the Glasgow offices have done. This is what the Edinburgh offices have done. Uh, you could look at, you know, new dashboards for what the contracting is. So you understand which speakers have signed up, you know, cause you, you have to organize, you know, you're paying for speakers to come and speak. And, and now you have a platform that just allows everyone to understand where you are. And you're in a position where someone says, we've not been sent the contract. You know, 30 seconds later, you're in Salesforce going, okay, the contract's not done for these reasons, or actually, yes, you have been sent the contract because I can see the email <laughs> that has the contract for you. So you're in the position where you're able to do lots of different things. Um, you know, we then went to a position where you start uh, you know, sponsoring students across the, in Scotland to do different things and suddenly you're collecting a whole series of new things that you're doing that you didn't think you were going to do before. You just do it on Salesforce. Um, after about two years of the Data Lab, I set up the Cancer Innovation Challenge, uh, which was using uh, 
million pounds from the Scottish government to try and accelerate innovation around data. And we just put all that on the same, on the same Salesforce implementation, just a new type of opportunity, uh, a few tweaks to the fields. But once again, you're in a position where you had a single source of truth that told you what was going on in the web. Um, and that was really key to allow us to do lots of different things because you had a platform that was flexible enough that you could customize it to start doing new things and stop doing old things. And you, you could do that you know, kind of as you just went along from day to day. And I, and I think that for us was really powerful because you know your platform needs to evolve as your organization evolves, as the things that you do evolve. And Salesforce really allowed us to do that. That's great. So you, you've, you talked about lots of different teams using you, using Salesforce. What sort of strategies do you put in place to ensure that sort of smooth transition and adoption by different employees in different departments with different requirements? That's really a cultural issue. Uh, and we found we had lots of cultural challenges around that. You would find, for example, that what a business development person thinks is okay isn't what a project manager thinks is okay. Uh, and so a lot of it was we have a lot of robust conversations about ways of working. And some of it was you start to develop different processes and different workflows that enable this. So, for example, a business development person could submit a project idea, but a project manager would be assigned and they would have to sign off on it before the management team signed off on it and before it went to the board. So you could build more robust processes that actually join teams together so that people were able to see what was coming. Because in one sense, the thing about Salesforce is you can see what's in the pipeline, but sometimes it just appears um, fully formed. And then you have to go, actually, is this the kind of thing we want? But you could be in a position where you went, okay, there's a process from business to business team to project manager to legal back to the project manager and then to kind of post board. And you could build all of that in Salesforce by making sure that you can't move to this stage unless you have a project manager assigned. So you're in a position where you force the teams to work together, you force the management team to work together by defining a set of processes that you have to, that you can't skip. And you know, if you want money, it has to be signed off on the management team. And that happens through sale, a set of Salesforce approvals. So you could use the Salesforce Salesforce's tools to formalize ways of working. You know, you, you can not just say this is how we'd like it to work, but you could build it in Salesforce so that you can't do this unless you've done it the way I've asked you to. Um, and that, you know, and that was really important because the in one sense, the data lab was not measured on how many projects we awarded funding to. It was on how successful were those projects. And that's why you needed actually, you needed collaborative working. Um, to be able to deliver DataFest at the scale it grew to, you needed to have a really close coordination between the, the managers who are running DataFest, the business development teams who are out getting sponsors, arranging events, and the contracting team who are getting contracts out of the door because you were in a position where you were spitting out, you know, two or 300 contracts um, just for this set of events. And then you still had business as usual to do as well. Um, so having a platform that was robust and flexible allowed us to, to do that and allowed people to have clarity. You know, this is how many things are waiting to contract. These are how many things just haven't been sorted out at the sponsorship end. People knew where they were. And it, it, the tool really enabled. We built a culture where people understood it's all on Salesforce. If it's not on Salesforce, it doesn't exist. Um, but you also had a culture where people were able to use that to collaborate and to hold each other accountable. Mm. And, and that was really important. Um, because yeah. generally speaking, at the data lab, we were very, the managers were quite hand off, hands off. Um, but then, but then you've built these platforms and processes so you can be quite hands off because you can see what's going on without asking people every day <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. Uh, was there any sort of like what, what was your, I guess, guiding light in measuring success and making sure that you were heading in the right direction with your implementation? Kind of, did you have specific success? criteria you measure you mentioned that you were 
GitLab's was measured by the success of the project that they were running, but for the implementation, kind of what was what was it that you you used to guide you, make sure that you're on the right path? I think some of it for me was it's a you start with you know I've done this really in I don't say in bad ways, but I've I've done many of these things in really awkward ways, and I don't want to do it in awkward ways anymore. And the team were quite close. The people were quite honest. No, this doesn't work for me. I don't understand why you're doing that. You'll get a lot of robust internal feedback. Um, but we're also in a position where the board who oversaw the data lab was very clear. We want to see numbers. We want to see data. And being able to go, well, here's a list of everyone in the pipeline. You know, that took 10 seconds. Is actually really important if you're writing a 70 page CEO report every quarter where you know, almost half of it is just automatically generated in Salesforce. And then taught you to, our CEO would talk to the other innovation centers and they were all like, how can you do this at scale so quickly with so little work? And it's like, well, because we, we've, we've built the platforms underneath to do this. Um, and I think particularly when you look at DataFest and the amount of work around that, people go, actually, we can see how this platform helps us do our job. Because you know, the platform is saying, I need to know these five things. You know, and that's it. You know, I'm not asking you for a hundred things. It's just, I need to know these things. And this is all you have to do. If you do this, we then move to the next stage. And people understood that people liked that clarity rather than being in a position where you do stuff and you give it to someone and you hope it's okay. You're in a position where you've done stuff. It's met the criteria. Things just flow through the pipeline. And I think it was really key. We spent a lot of time talking with everyone else about the need to invest in, <laughs> in technology and platforms to make their lives easier. Um, but for most, for many people, that's a real challenge. Um, but for the data lab, you know, we tell people data can make your life easier. And it was really important for us to eat our own dog food. Um, and Salesforce was, was, you know, the key to all of that. Let's, let's talk about challenges. What, what are the challenges for the, the wider higher education sector and in, in harnessing the power of, of all the relationships they've got, students, business organizations, alumni, and how do you see that future develop? I think that's a huge challenge, particularly for UK organizations. Um, I think UK organizations are incredibly siloed. Um, at an organizational level, they're probably quite immature when you compare it to, to the private sector. Um, Without being rude, they are full of managers who aren't professional managers, and that provides a real challenge. Uh, many people at universities don't understand how universities actually work. You know, stuff just happens somewhere. <laughs> and, and being able to say, actually, strategically, you need to understand how all of these things link together. You know, where are your students coming from? Where are your students going? Uh, you need to understand these things if you actually want to be able to make use of, you know, the opportunities that might be there. But it's really difficult. Uh, IT literacy is not brilliant. I think platform literacy isn't brilliant. Um, there needs to be a, a willingness on the part of universities to invest in platforms and people. Uh, there was a point, I think, probably about five years ago, when if you went across the University of Edinburgh and said, how many people here have a MailChimp, ac MailChimp account? There would have been hundreds. And, but it's like, do, are you people working together? Do you have a community of practice around this? Do you have ways where you are trying to understand how you can use these platforms to work better and easier? Um, everybody in universities spends a huge amount of time reinventing the wheel. And that's a challenge. You know, if you are, for example, um, when I came to Edinburgh, you know, I was working, I said, on the UK Carbon Capture and Storage Research Centre. You know, it was a 15 million pound project. And the university was like, well, congratulations. Here's some cost codes. Off you go. And you think, well, I actually need more than this to deliver this. You know, do you have platforms I can use? And, you know, and the answer is kind of, no. You know, we don't have platforms. We don't have IT support for these things. And I think these are some of the real gaps. You know, the way the internet has evolved since then, you, you can find help everywhere now. But I think actually having communities of practice in institutions that go, this is how we do these things. 
you know, so I can remember presenting to colleagues at Edinburgh about how we use Salesforce and why we use Salesforce and how it makes our lives simpler at the data lab. And you can see all these people going, oh, God, I wish we could do that. And the reality is then there's no reason why you can't, you know, but as an organizational level, you have to be willing to invest in platforms to enable people. And I think that's that's a big jump for many UK higher education institutions. But if you can make that jump, you can have far more impact. You can get more done with less staff. You know, your staff can actually be doing, doing things that are really important rather than spending the time managing data and trying to understand what's going on. Because at the moment, a lot of stuff is done really manually. Um, platforms like Salesforce allow us to allow the data lab to scale what we did tremendously. And, and I think we're a really good example of what you could do. Um, but it requires organizational commitment. And I think that's kind of a real challenge for many institutions. Um, they are used to, you don't want to say a fund and forget model, but a lot of it has been a fund and forget model. But if you actually want to enable things across an organization, you have to invest in it. And that that's a combination of money, people. And as I said right at the beginning, it's about building a culture where people can go, I need to do this. Someone in this organization has probably done it before. How do I find that person? And then how, <laughs> and how can I pick their brains? <laughs> no, how can I learn how to do this in two days rather than two weeks? And I think that that's kind of the biggest challenge um, universities face. Yeah. No, that's brilliantly put. Not reinventing the wheel uh, over and over again, uh, using what's already been been done. I think that's a that's a a great um, uh, quote to end the, um, the 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 episode with. Uh, so we've reached the end. That was the last question. Thank you so much. Dave, it's been a pleasure talking to you here um, about this topic. Um, and to all the listeners, if you want to hear more from Dr. Dave Fitch uh, about this topic and from our other speakers as well, we have an event coming up in Cambridge in uh, February, 28th of February next year. So we will be sharing the, the, the link for a sign up to that event. And please do, do sign up and um, you can you can hear more there. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank welcome. you. Thank you.